All right, so in the first set of slides, we talked mostly about um, principles of open fracture management, Castillo classification, the role of uh, uh, de Breedmont. Um, in this uh, next set of slides, I'm first going to start with a video. Um, and this is really uh, just to illustrate some um, de Breedmont techniques uh, for open fracture management. Uh, this is uh, actually an open femur fracture. Uh, but I think will help uh, to illustrate some principles. So here you need to assess whether the muscle is viable, make sure it contracts, bleeds, has consistency and uh, appropriate color because it's a medium for infection if you leave it alone. All right, so this is all dead muscle here. So we're going to extend the incision uh, or open fracture laceration proximally and distally and then try to debride any necrotic muscle. So here you can see the muscle is contracting nicely, but here it's non-contractile. So that's not bleeding. It looks to be uh, devitalized, so it's going to be aggressively and sharply debrided until you get to viable tissue. So you can see that the uh, it's been extended proximally, although the fracture is actually quite distal. So we're also going to have to extend the open uh, fracture laceration distally in order to better delineate the um, extent of the uh, muscle injury and also identify the fracture fragment and debride that appropriately. Because you have to actually get the bone ends to debride them as well. So here you can see Approximately the muscle is still non-viable, non-contractile, so I may have to extend this a little bit more and aggressively debride all this tissue until you get to healthy uh, bleeding margins that look viable. So this again it has to be aggressive debridement down to healthy tissue and get all that out. And here you can see all the necrotic bone and muscle and soft tissue that has been resected. So now you've got healthy margins. You can see the femur down there and you've got uh, healthy uh, viable muscle. It's contractile. It's got nice color and consistently uh, consistency. Still a little bit of subfascial hematoma there but most of the muscle here uh, looks uh, pretty normal and uh, we're happy with that so far. So now we're going to expose the fracture. Here you can see again the um, femoral shaft that came through the wound. Uh, is going to be exposed and uh, uh, debrided. So you're going to deliver this, you're going to irrigate the bone end, you're going to curette to uh, debride the end of the uh, bone end and decontaminate it, get any uh, foreign material off of that. All right, so that's the distal part of the proximal fragment that presumably came through the wound and any small devitalized fragments are going to be resected as they are considered nidus for infection and necrotic. So you can see all the debrided uh, portions in there. Um, so let's pick up now with the uh, with the PowerPoint slides. Um, so the next step after debridement is going to be fracture stabilization, and you need to think a step ahead. Actively pre-op plan your cases. Uh, make sure your staff in the OR knows uh, what it is you're going to do. Uh, I like to post it up in the OR. Uh, so that uh, we're on the same page with the staff. Uh, doesn't mean you necessarily have to keep walking up and looking at it, but um, that's the plan. That's what you were thinking. Now everybody knows what you're thinking. They don't have to read your mind. Um, all right? Uh, they have what you need. Uh, the fracture stabilization could be definitive uh, for relatively simple wounds and fractures when you take that patient to the, to the OR that day. Um, it could be temporizing, like an external fixer shown in this example, for complex wounds and complex fracture patterns. Okay, so you, you do need to think a step ahead, especially if you're doing provisional fixation, what is potentially going to be done next so you can plan accordingly. So when you're doing external fixation, you might need different X-fix sets depending on what body part you're operating on. Now, your center may have multiple sets, you may only have one set, you may not have a set that addresses the part of the body you need to deal with, so you have to think about that. Um, uh, pin 
sizes. So, so in the femur and pelvis, we often use six millimeter pins in the tibia humerus, uh, and sometimes in the pelvis we use five millimeter pins. Uh, sometimes in the femur as well, uh, and then in four millimeter pins are like across the forearm, elbow, and the foot, and then smaller X fixes in the hand and um, and forefoot. Okay, so these may not all live in one set, or maybe they do, but you need to know uh, at your institution which sets have what. Now, provisional external fixation, uh, for instance, this is a case uh, here you can see, uh, presumably there's uh, perhaps some proximal tibia fracture here, so this is a spanning external fixer that's been fasciotomies. Um, you're doing external fixation here as a, as a form of traveling traction. Right? You're getting the fracture out to length, you're getting the limb out to length, you're essentially applying traction, so keep the pins out of the zone of injury. Most surgeons, I think, would agree on this. Uh, if you can't do it, you can't do it, but, and then you try to keep the pins as clean as possible. But think about where your definitive external, uh, internal fixation might be. Um, so you don't necessarily have to go overboard. It's really traveling traction. Something like this, you, you could, if you had to, augment with a posterior splint in the back of the leg or something like that. Okay, so um, next thing is dead space management. So remember, it's important to take up empty space. Fluid, hematoma is going to fill in there. Uh, bacteri bacteria will find its way in otherwise. Um, antibiotic beads and spacers are a nice way to uh, achieve this. Um, there are multiple uh, recipes, so to speak. Um, one such recipe would be uh, 2 to 3 grams of vancomycin and 2.2 to 3.6 grams of tobramycin powder uh, in one packet of cement, for instance. Um, beads are good for short-term use. They have, you know, the same amount of cement. They have more surface area, therefore more antibiotics. Um, but long-term, they can get uh, stuck and um, they can get difficult to take out. So um, spacers, or like a block spacer, uh, comes out easier. There, there's a membrane that forms around it. So if you're putting it in for the long term, usually we use block spacers. Um, but these do two things, right? They take up dead space and they deliver antibiotics. So they're really, really good to use. And you should really think about them on the initial time you take them to the operating room to put those in there. I mean, you keep giving all these IV antibiotics. Why not give local antibiotics? So initial wound coverage, don't try to pull the wounds tightly with like retention sutures and you know, hogging it together. Um, if you have to, you can use a bead pouch, simple dressings, negative pressure wound dressings if that wound's not going to come together, especially if you're looks like you're heading for a flap. Uh, here's an example of a, a negative pressure uh, wound therapy for an open fracture wound. Now, many of these patients will need repeat trips to the operating room. You have to assess for the need for further debridement, second and third looks. Maybe you have to have your plastic surgery colleagues come in. Maybe you need beads or a vac. So plan on or perform definitive fracture fixation uh, and uh, wound coverage and try to get that done within about a week. So it may take a lot of coordination, um, but earlier coverage and fixation uh, uh, when possible is better so you don't have the wound just chronically exposed to the hospital environment. So a couple of things with the, the wound also to consider are uh, injuries where the skin is open but without skin loss, like a degloving type injury like shown here. Or you may have a closed degloving injury. Now that's not as pertinent to the mangled open extremity, but just another uh, consideration that can happen uh, in, in certain type of uh, related injuries. Uh, or you can just have skin loss altogether. Now you need to do skin grafting. Other soft tissue considerations are compartment syndrome, uh, muscle tissue loss, marginal muscle tissues that need second, uh, third looks, and then nerve and vascular injuries. So I think I'm going to pause there. Uh, this next topic is kind of a big topic dealing with bone loss, um, and it's an important one. So I think we'll pick this up in the next set of slides. Thank you.